This lecture is part of a series of lectures on homological algebra. And um, this lecture will be the introductory lecture. And what we will be discussing is the functor Tor, um, which for two abelian groups A and B gives you another abelian group denoted by Tor A and B. Um, and I'll start with a sort of historical introduction about where these groups originally come from. Um, so the earliest appearance of these was probably introduced by, by Czech, who was looking at the following problem. Um, suppose you've got um, some sort of manifold M. Then it's got homology groups, um, which are usually denoted by HI of M with coefficients in Z. And more generally, you can define homology groups of M with coefficients in a group G. Well, we don't really need to worry too much about what these were. And Czech was looking at the following problem, um, which is express HI of M with coefficients in G in terms of HI of M with coefficients in Z. In other words, if you know the integer homology groups of a manifold, can you find the homology groups with coefficients in some other group? And Czech found an answer as follows. There's an exact sequence where you take the integer homology and tensor with G, and then here you get the homology of M with coefficients in G, which is what you're trying to calculate. And then here we get this mysterious group Tor H I minus one M with coefficients in Z and G. So, um, and that goes to naught. And th this actually splits in a non-canonical way. So this tells you what the homology of M with coefficients in G is in terms of the homology of M with coefficients in Z, provided you know what this rather mysterious group is. Um, actually, this is kind of fake history because Czech didn't write down an exact sequence like this because um, most of this notation was actually invented after Czech was working. So, so this is the way history ought to have developed, not the way it actually developed. Um, so the, 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 the second example of where these groups tore turn up is... Suppose you take an exact sequence, naught goes to A, goes to B, goes to C, goes to zero of abelian groups, and you tensor it with some other group M. So we get A tensor M goes to B tensor M goes to C tensor M goes to zero, and this is exact. And the problem is that this map here need not be injective. So tension with M doesn't preserve exactness. And I just quickly remind everybody, the standard example of this is where you take naught goes to Z, goes to Z, goes to Z over two Z, goes to zero, where this is multiplication by two. And if we tensor it with Z over two Z, we get Z over two Z goes to Z over two Z, goes to z over 2z, goes to zero, and this is multiplication by two and is not injective. And the fact that this isn't injective is sort of a major headache because it makes calculating everything rather a pain. And it turns out this Tor group kind of fixes this problem because we get the following long exact sequence. We get naught goes to Tor A M, goes to Tor B M, goes to Tor C M, goes to A tensor M, goes to B tensor M, goes to C tensor M, goes to zero. And this is now an exact sequence. So, so this group Tor C with M kind of controls um, the fact that this, this map here is not necessarily injective. In particular, if this group here happens to be zero, then this map here is injective. And we can control the kernel of this map by this group here, and we can control the kernel of this map by this group here. And finally, um, this map here is injective. Um, 
actually it's only injected because we're working over the integers over more general for modules over more general rings this map here need not be injective and things get more interesting or more complicated or whatever um so that's two places these tor groups turn up um they turn up in this universal coefficient theorem in algebraic topology and they turn up when you try and control lack of exactness of tensor products. So the next question is, how do you define these, um, these groups? Um, so let's give the definition of Tor A and B for abelian groups. And what we do is we choose a free resolution of A. What this means is we choose an exact sequence, naught goes to Z to the M, goes to Z to the N, goes to A, goes to zero. Since we're working over the integers, the kernel of this map is also free, which makes life very easy. And then we tensor this with um, B, and we get B to the M, goes to B to the N, goes to A, goes to zero. And as we commented, this map need not be injective in general. Um, so it's got a kernel, and the kernel is Tor A B. So um, this definition gives various problems. First of all, where does the definition come from? So what was the motivation for it? This seems a rather odd construction when you first see it. The second problem is it seems to depend on the resolution of um, this group A. Um, so we need to do something about that. The third problem is why is it called Tor? And fourth problem is how do we compute it? Because this um, definition looks rather cumbersome, um, but as we'll see fairly shortly, it's actually reasonably easy to compute. And um, so we'll um, spend the rest of this talk answering these four questions. So first of all, Let's explain where the definition comes from. Well, the motivation for this definition, sort of definition, comes from algebraic topology. Um, what we do is we choose a manifold M, and suppose it has, suppose we can triangulate it. So, you know, M is sort of covered with these simplexes. Um, and what we can do is we can form a chain complex. C0 goes to C1, goes to C2, and so on, where Ci has a basis of the i-dimensional simplexes. And this is a complex that's got a boundary map where you take each simplex to its boundary as an algebraic topology. And we can compute the homology of M to be the homology groups of this complex. For instance, uh, more precisely, HI of M is equal to the kernel of the map from CI to CI minus one divided by the image of CI plus one to CI. Um, more generally, we can compute the homology of M with coefficients in a group G. And to do this, we take the complex C2 tensor of G goes to C1 tensor of G goes to C0 tensor of G and so on. And this is defined to be the homology of this, this complex. So, um, so it was a common operation in topology to take a, a, a chain complex of free modules, um, tensor it with a group, and then take the homology of the resulting 
of, of, of the results. And this is exactly what we were doing in the definition of Tor. We were taking some sort of complex, tensoring it with a group B, and then taking the homology of that. You see Tor is really the homology of this complex of this rather small complex of modules B, M, and B to the N. So the definition of Tor was or possibly motivated by the definition of homology of a complex. Um, so the second question is, um, why does the definition of Tor not depend on which chain complex we, we use? Well, again, um, the motivation for the proof of this comes from algebraic topology. Um, so M can have two different triangulations. And the problem is, do we get the same um, homology groups independent of the triangulation? And this is actually a very tricky question. Um, um, the slightly easier question you can ask is suppose we've got a map from uh, um, M to N. In fact, suppose we've got two maps from M to N, F and G. We can ask, do these induce the same um, map from the homology groups of M to the homology groups of N? And the answer is they do, provided F and G are homotopic. On the level of chain complexes, we can talk about two chain complexes being homotopic, um, or at least two maps between chain complexes being homotopic. Um, as follows. So suppose we've got two maps, F here, and, sorry, F there, and G, but from, so we've got two maps, F and G, from a chain complex C to a chain complex D. And these F and G induce um, the same map on homology, if they are homotopic. So what does homotopic mean? Well, homotopic um, looks a bit odd. What it means is there's a map going from CI to DI plus one. Um, let's call this map D, such that, uh, let's not call it, sorry, not call it D, it's called S. So D is the map. Going, going like that, such that SD minus DS is equal to F minus G. And this is the algebraic analog of two maps being homotopic in algebraic topology. Um, and um, it turns out that this idea of using homotopic maps can be used to show that if you've got two different um, resolutions of an abelian group, then they give the same um, Tor groups. So we're going to go in, into this in more detail um, in, a, in a later lecture. Um, but the, the answer to the question is, how do you know that the definition of Tor doesn't depend on the resolution, is that we're going to use this idea of um, two maps between complexes being homotopic that comes from algebraic topology. So the third question is, why is this group called Tor? So where does the name Tor comes from? Well, the answer is that Tor A and B, for finitely generated abelian groups, depends only on the torsion subgroups of A and B. So the torsion subgroups just consist of the elements of finite order. I never quite figured out why the elements of finite order are called torsion, but anyway. Um, so fourth question we want to do is, how do we compute these groups? 
So what we're going to do is we're going to compute tor A and B for A and B finitely generated abelian groups. Um, well, first of all, we note that tor of A plus B C is isomorphic to tor of A C plus tor B C and tor of A B plus C is obviously going to satisfy the same form. It's tor A B plus tor A and C. And the proof of this is easy and completely uninteresting to watch. So I'm going to skip it. Um, it basically depends on the fact that the same formula is true if you replace tor by tensor products and um, is, is just an easy exercise. Um, so we just need to compute tor A, B for A and B cyclic because any finitely generated abelian group is a direct sum of cyclic groups, so we can reduce to this case. So let's compute tor of z with g. Well, what we do is we choose a resolution of z. Naught goes to z, sorry, naught goes to naught, goes to z, goes to z, goes to naught. So here we've got a resolution of z by two free abelian groups, so this would be um, z to the m, and this would be the group z to the n. And um, it's particularly trivial to do this because z is already a free abelian group. And now we tensor with g, so we get naught tensor g goes to z tensor g, and this is equal to zero, and this is equal to g. And tor of z of g is the kernel of this. Well, it's pretty obvious what the kernel of this is. It's just zero. So tor of z with coefficient of tor of z and g is always zero for any finitely generated, in fact, any abelian group g whatsoever. So that was easy. Now let's look at tor z over n z with coefficients in g. And now the um, Free resolution of this is a little bit more interesting because we get naught goes to z goes to z goes to z over n z goes to naught, where this is, of course, multiplication by n. Now we tensor this with g and we get z tensor g goes to z tensor g goes to z over n z tensor g goes to zero. And now what we want is to work out the kernel of this. So, so this map here is multiplication by n. And z tensor g is, of course, just g. So we've really got a map g goes to g, which is multiplication by n. And in here we have tor z over n z um, of g. Well, so, so this is just equal to the elements of order n in G. Um, so now we can work out tor of Z over NZ for G cyclic. So tor Z over NZ and Z over MZ is going to be the elements of order N in Z over MZ. And if you think about it a bit, you'll see this is isomorphic to Z over MNZ, where this is the greatest common divisor of M and N. And tor of Z over NZ z with coefficients in z is in particular just zero. So this is calculated tor for all finitely generated abelian groups. Um, you notice that tor of a b for finitely generated abelian groups depends only on, on the torsion of a and b as we mentioned earlier. Um, you can also note that in the examples we've calculated, tor A and B seems to be isomorphic to tor B and A. Um, this turns out to be true in general, 
In fact, it's also true over arbitrary rings, although this takes a little bit of work to prove. Um, note that this isn't at all obvious because although A tends to B is isomorphic to B tends to A, we've defined Tor asymmetrically. We take a, a free resolution of A and tense it with B. Um, so for this one, we take a free resolution of B and we tense it with A. Um, so it's, it's actually quite remarkable that we get the same answer, um, whichever we do. Um, we can also note that for A and B finite, um, Tor A B happens to be isomorphic to A tensor B. However, this is a rather bad isomorphism. And you shouldn't really use it. The point is, there's no natural isomorphism from Tor A and B to A tensor B in general. Um, um, this is a natural isomorphism. There's only one sensible isomorphism between these two groups. However, although you can find an isomorphism of this group, it depends on the choice of generators of A and B. And if you change generators, you'll get a different isomorphism between these two groups. Um, so um, I'll just finish by uh, mentioning possible further reading. The ultimate source of homological algebra is the original book on homological algebra by Carton and Eilenberg. Although it's many decades old, it's still one of the best introductions to homological algebra, written by um, the founders of homological algebra, who are two of the greatest mathematicians of last century. Um, so um, anyone interested in homological algebra should just get a copy of this book and try reading it. Um, okay, next lecture we will be doing more about the um, um, tensor product of abelian groups. In particular, we will try and prove that it, the definition of tensor product doesn't actually depend on the choice of resolution.